Okay, I think we're uh, just about ready to tee off. So first and foremost, uh, welcome everyone uh, joining the uh, second illustration of the Cocktails to Go uh, webcast, uh, delivered responsibly to your door. Uh, we've got an esteemed panel and uh, hopefully uh, we'll tee up a, a great discussion on this hot topic as we all navigate through the pandemic. So thank you again for everyone. I'm Chris Swanger, the President and CEO of the Distilled Spirits Council. And as you can imagine, Discus has been very engaged and very, very involved in supporting the Cocktails to Go initiatives uh, when the pandemic uh, got kicked off. Uh, obviously, Cocktails to Go has been a great economic lifeline for the hospitality sector. I think as many of you know, you know, closures and social dis distancing has really devastated the hospitality industry. Just think about it. Restaurant sales are down by 78%. They've lost millions and millions of jobs. Craft distillers have lost 700 million in sales and have had to furlough employees as well. So the long-term impact on local neighborhood restaurants and distillers has been pretty significant. Thankfully, uh, over the last seven or eight months, uh, states have really uh, uh, gravitated to innovative solutions that could provide economic lifelines to many of these restaurants and retailers and distilleries around the country. On a state snapshot, 31 states and DC allowed delivery from liquor stores and other off-premise retailers. And then as we move forward, uh, we need to think about how uh, to make sure all of this is done responsibly. Uh, in addition, 22 states and DC have allowed the delivery from restaurant and bars as well. So the, the point of the panel today is to just talk about uh, any time you change uh, rules and regulations related to alcohol, always top of mind has to be the responsibility standards to make sure the product is uh, delivered appropriately, delivered to those of legal purchase age, and just done safely. Everyone in, in our industry, and in including the broader hospitality sector, uh, wants to see everybody to enjoy the product responsibly and in moderation and all of the above. And the good thing that has happened as a result of all of these marketplace changes, you know, state restrictions have included making sure that the, the packaging is sealed in secured containers. There's limits on the number and the size. Should it be, uh, should food purchase be included in that? And of course, always, we always need to verify uh, the customer age is over 21 years of age. And we should never ever uh, deliver product to beverage alcohol to anyone that is intoxicated or overserved as well. So with that, we have a very, very esteemed panel uh, and we're joined here by uh, General uh, Bentley Nettles, uh, the Executive Director of the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission. Uh, General Nettles uh, is Brig Brigadier General in the Texas National Guard, and very, very lucky. He's been on the front lines in, in making sure to navigate these regulations uh, for my fellow Texans. So thank you, General Nettles, for being here. We also have Allison Wiley, Public Policy Manager for Uber Eats. They've been on the front lines in delivering the product as well. And we have Maria Jackson, uh, Director and Associate General Counsel for Instacart. And of course, we've got Scott Harris. Uh, the, uh, he heads Cocton Creek Distillery, a beautiful distillery in Percival, Virginia. And uh, Scott's really been on the front lines and be, being able to deliver product. And uh, we really, really appreciate the Virginia ABC support and all of that. And then we got Richard Nguyen. Uh, Richard's with Nam Biat Restaurant here in Arlington, Virginia, and Richard uh, will be able to tell us some of the challenges that he's had to navigate uh, as a result of the, the pandemic and all the challenges and how the delivery of beverage alcohol has been an important element of that. And then lastly, we have Rick Burt. Uh, Rick is the president and CEO of 
students against destructive uh, decisions, SAD. And uh, responsibility.org has long worked with Rick just to make sure that the industry is in close collaboration to prevent underage drinking. So for our panelists, thank you for being here. And we're going to tee it up for our first question. And it's going to go over to General Nettles. So General Nettles, uh, as we understand, a certain Texas retailers, such as those operating like restaurants, have been legally allowed to deliver beverage alcohol to their patrons with the proper permitting, or they may have alcohol delivered to patrons by third-party delivery services. Uh, also, they have to hold the proper permit. Could you tell us how the TABC has helped manage this process and to make sure this is done in a safe and effective way, but at the same time, really, really helping the hospitality sector as well in the great state of Texas. So General Nettles, over to you, sir. Sure, first, thanks for having me. Um, it's a real challenging time for the alcohol industry, uh, but the last legislative session in Texas created consumer delivery. So there are two ways that retailers can typically do that, a restaurant, can have their own employees deliver the alcohol, or they can use a consumer delivery, which we have a new consumer delivery permit, uh, folks like Uber Eats. As you might expect, this is new for us, so a bit of a challenge. Uh, I'm kind of the belt and suspenders guy, so you can use two mechanisms. One is a app uh, that makes sure that it's delivered to someone over 21. Uh, they're not intoxicated, there's some kind of signature or you can use the driver education training. We now have that up on our website. It's a kind of soft rollout. We're talking to uh, industry members to give us some beta testing on it to make sure it works, but that will allow the driver uh, to have a certificate from us for two years, which basically goes through very similar training like a seller server uh, bartender at, at a retail establishment. Uh, but so that, that dealt with the consumer delivery, deliver from a retailer to the consumer's house uh, with the governor's um, executive orders and waivers. The challenge we had here in Texas was, and I suspect in other locations, people didn't really want other people picking up their food and delivering it or their alcohol. So they'd rather drive up to the restaurant and pick it up. And so the governor allowed uh, to go, uh, which is, interesting, uh, created a bit of a challenge for us, but I think it is uh, certainly something that the industry was able to take care of. Of course, we hold the industry, the, the retailers to the same standards, and they've been doing a pretty good job with it. Um, I suspect that in the next legislative session, they're going to take that up as a change to the statute, but right now it's simply authorized as a waiver by the governor's office. Uh, so if you want to get your margarita to go in Texas, you can pull up to your favorite Mexican restaurant and uh, get that to go. Um, great opportunity for the industry to hopefully stay afloat till we get past this. Absolutely, General Nettles, and no, no doubt. I mean, the, the feedback that we've picked up from consumers all across the country, it, it does provide a little bit of normalcy. If you can connect with your neighborhood bartender or getting that margarita from your favorite uh, Mexican food restaurant in Texas and so forth. But we also appreciate and understand we've, we've got to navigate through this carefully with the hospitality sector uh, just to make sure uh, that none of this uh, prompts uh, underage drinking or drinking and driving and, and all of those type issues. So Allison, uh, here with Uber, Uber launched a new initiative this past summer to ensure safe delivery of alcohol. And I, I would imagine with everything going on uh, with your Uber drivers around the country, this has been a very important initiative for, for the, the Uber crew all around the country. Allison, welcome. Thank you so much, Chris, and to responsibility.org for having me today. Um, so you're right. It's been it's been a, a, a tough year all around, obviously. And, you know, the world just feels so different. Um, but but business, I think this is especially true for restaurants. Um, so over the past few months, we've been doing a lot of work to support our restaurant partners. 
you know, from launching new products and initiatives that help restaurants more easily and quickly stand up their takeout and delivery um, to launching kind of um, some new safety features and initiatives uh, to support restaurants and delivery people during COVID. Uh, and as part of these efforts, we've also been working to help restaurants pivot and increase check sizes and margins uh, by helping them deliver new items like family style meals, meal kits, and alcohol. Um, in a recent survey we commissioned um, with Technomic, uh, we surveyed about 400 to 500 restaurants in the US and Canada. Um, we found that these, these new items and particularly alcohol delivery have been especially helpful in increasing the margins uh, for restaurants during COVID. Um, and it's been really promising to see policymakers take action quickly uh, to modernize rules related to the delivery of alcohol and unlocking uh, this really important channel um, for restaurants right now. And so the, the consumer uh, delivery permit um, that um, Bentley just, just, just talked through um, that was introduced in Texas, this is one example um, that has been really promising uh, for restaurants. And so we've been working uh, carefully and quickly to ensure that our restaurant partners in a number of cities across the US can leverage Uber Eats to take advantage of, of this delivery opportunity. And as we unlock this opportunity for restaurants and merchants, we're putting safety first. Safety is a top priority at Uber. And in the past few years, we've kicked off a comprehensive effort across the company. We've um, launched new safety features and policies. We've strengthened our background screenings for drivers. We've developed new technology and we've tripled the size of our safety team, which has been really, really exciting. Um, and our, our commitment to safety is true across all that we do, including alcohol delivery. So we first started piloting alcohol delivery in Florida uh, last year. I think early 2019 is when we first started. Uh, we worked closely with the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association on our approach. So we understand the risks of alcohol delivery and have thought through product and operational processes to ensure that any sale of alcohol via delivery on Uber Eats is just as safe as a sale in store. So what this looks like. For customers, we make sure they're aware of the age restrictions and ID requirements when browsing alcoholic items in the app. So they receive pop-up notifications when they start browsing these items. Uh, so they know that um, they, they must actually agree to being 21 or older and to show their delivery partner a valid government issued photo ID before the order can even be placed. We've also rolled out ID scanning technology in the app that verifies that the ID holder is at least 21 years of age or older and that the ID is valid. And this is something that the delivery person will, um, will use this technology when they get to the door and deliver the, the alcohol. And so all delivery people uh, on the app uh, must opt in to do alcohol delivery. And as part of the, the opt-in process, they're made aware of the laws surrounding alcohol delivery, including the age requirements, the ID requirements, the sobriety requirements. And so delivery people must also review a list of acceptable forms of ID uh, and also common indicators that a person may or may not be sober. Um, and this, inf this information is reinforced to delivery people on an ongoing basis. And so the app guides the delivery person through ID verification and the sobriety check for, for compliant deliveries. And once they're en route to a customer, they're also made aware that the order contains alcohol and that additional steps are required uh, once uh, at the point of delivery. And you know, if the customer is underage, if that ID doesn't check out, um, or if the customer is intoxicated or not there, maybe they're not at home, maybe they're not coming to the door, a return flow is initiated in, in the app and the delivery person will be prompted to leave only the food item at the door, but to return the item to the merchant. Um, the customer is charged a, a restocking fee for this and the delivery person is compensated, of course, for that return leg uh, to the merchant. And um, trips with alcohol also have customized in-app support features for the delivery person in case something goes wrong, in case they need additional support. Uh, and of course, they can always call 911 directly from the app if anything goes wrong. Um, so we also have a policy in place that will disable alcohol for users who have attempted to purchase alcohol underage. So we track that very closely and we remove um, the alcohol from, from that user's app um, if, if they're underage. So all in all, we're, we're still in the early stages of expanding alcohol delivery across the US, but we're excited by the progress. And of course, it's something that, you know, we know is really meaningful for restaurants. We've heard it loud and clear. Uh, and so it's something we plan to continue uh, to prioritize um, over the next few years. 
And so I have one more slide, if you can just switch over to that. Um, perfect. And so beyond our alcohol delivery efforts, we've continued to focus on our ongoing safety commitments to support our drivers, delivery people, and customers during COVID, including implementing a mandatory face covering policy and committing over $50 million for health safety supplies for drivers and delivery people. So this is masks, hand sanitizers, wipes, uh, things like that. And so while we work to keep ourselves and those around us safe, another danger has developed on roadways um, that I think many of you on this call are, are very aware of, but an increase in traffic fatality rates nationally, um, even as we've seen vehicle mile, miles traveled go down in recent months. And so to help address these core safety concerns during COVID, you know, including speeding, distracted, intoxicated driving, Uber has convened a road safety coalition with road safety experts, including the National National Safety Council, the Governor's Highway Safety Association, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and also the League of American Bicyclists uh, to develop safety tips and reminders to help road users safely return to the road. Um, so I, I think I'm at time. I apologize for taking a bit longer than I should have, but uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from the rest of the panel and also uh, for the uh, Q&A session at the end. You got it, Allison, and thank you. And looks, you know, just but looking at this, I mean, Uber Eats is uh, trying to cover all the bases from investing in training for the drivers, uh, putting expectations and touch points by the, the consumers and the customers looking to use it. And look, this is a work in progress. We recognize that and uh, we'll learn along the way, uh, but really appreciate Uber Eats' leadership on putting safety first, safety for the drivers, safety for the patrons, uh, in really support of the hospitality sector as well. So we have Maria with Instacart. Uh, Maria, I know Instacart is also very, very committed to state safety as well. Could you just tell us a little bit about uh, Instacart's uh, program for responsibility and safety as well? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to be here. Um, and yes, Instacart is very committed to responsible delivery of alcohol. Um, we have a strong compliance record. We've been doing this for, for some time now. Um, and we do believe that alcohol can be delivered responsibly and safely. Um, currently, we uh, facilitate the delivery of alcohol from off-premise retailers in 22 states and the District of Columbia. And we have seen a significant increase in the number of orders since the pandemic. Um, orders in general, but also orders that contain alcohol. And we do think that there's obvious that we're obviously meeting a need, a consumer need. As you stated earlier, we are meeting the consumer where they are. And these days they're home. And so we do think that it's important to uh, be committed to safe, safely and responsibly delivering alcohol. Um, in a similar, similarly to Uber, we require um, shoppers that want to opt in and to um, take alcohol orders. They must be at least 21. They also have to go through our alcohol training and the alcohol training is very similar to what you might see in like a seller server scenario. Um, it includes information about the alcohol laws. It includes information about the effects of alcohol on the body and how you identify someone that might be intoxicated. It also uh, walks the, the shopper through the verification of an ID, how to detect a fake ID, and how to politely kind of refuse to deliver that alcohol if, if you find that that person is intoxicated or, or underage. And so um, that's on the, on the shopper side on the consumer side obviously we also require that the that the consumer enter their date of birth that they agree to an alcohol agreement where they're certifying among other things that they are above the legal purchase age um, and we also have push notifications um, as the shopper is approaching the consumer's home the consumer gets a reminder that they have alcohol in their basket and that they have to be prepared to present a valid government issued id um, Similarly, the shopper gets the same notification on their side, and then they get walked through the process with prompts and, you know, push notifications on the app so that they have to go through each of those steps in order 
order to be able to complete the alcohol delivery. Uh, we also provide um, real-time access to a care team that will walk a shopper through uh, any issue that, any situation that seems difficult or they don't know how to, how to manage it. Um, they, they can call the care team and get, get walked through that entire process. The care team can also engage directly with the consumer if there's a situation that, that requires it. Um, we do ask shoppers and we do encourage shoppers to err on the side of caution. If something doesn't seem right, if there's a situation where they're delivering to a house where there appear to be a lot of underage um, people in the background, but somebody that is over 21 comes to the door, um, th that they have the ability to refuse and to remove the alcohol and begin the return flow back to, to the retailer. Um, so obviously we also have the, the app, um, within the app we do the scan, we scan the ID to verify that they're overage and that the ID is valid. Um, we think that because this is such a, a need and such a great service to provide to people at home, whether it's somebody that doesn't want to go grocery shopping because they they have health concerns, or it's someone like me who has two children who are doing distance learning at home and who, ha who has a full-time job, and I don't want to go shopping, um, that I can get my, my needs met in a safe and you know, responsible manner. And I, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that we're sharing best practices because I do think as an industry, it is our responsibility to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Team effort and congratulations for Instacart and, and being in the game and helping really set high standards of responsibility. We'll talk to Rick, Rick Burt, one of our other panelists, because, you know, sometimes teenagers can really find creative ways to you know, circle around uh, one way or the other, right? And it uh, looks like both with Uber Eats and Instacart's leadership, you're trying to cover all the bases just to uphold high standards. So turning over to Scott. Uh, Scott, uh, you've had to manage delivery of uh, distilled spirits uh, at the distillery. Uh, Scott, tell us what uh, y'all been doing over at the distillery and how the delivery of uh, your great distilled spirits has helped you over the last five or six months. Yeah, hi, thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Responsibility.org, uh, for having me on here. Uh, my name is Scott Harris, and I'm one of the co-founders, along with my wife, Becky, of Catoctin Creek Distillery in Percival, Virginia. And uh, we've been around for about 12 years. And um, at the beginning of COVID, um, we had to close our tasting room for a period of about two months that we had um, zero sales uh, from our tasting room. So our tasting room operates as a distillery store and uh, it was completely um, down to zero for those first two months of COVID. At which point the governor in Virginia, um, along with the Virginia ABC, uh, did an executive order and allowed distilleries in the state to ship directly to customers uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, Virginia, in fact, was one of the first states to allow this. Um, we actually, um, our distillery store functions in the state law as a Virginia ABC store. And so this is the model which has been successful for us in deliveries. Now the Virginia ABC is piloting uh, delivery through their other stores, their non-distillery stores in the Norfolk area. Um, when we, when we do it, the rules are that we must use a common carrier. So we must use a, uh, a company like FedEx or UPS to deliver the spirits. Uh, and we have to conduct age verification. So on our website, when you place an order, you'll see an age verification um, uh, checkbox. But we also um, ask for the birth date on the order as well. Um, and then the, uh, FedEx, in our case, uh, we'll also verify the age of the consumer upon delivery. So we use their process for alcohol stickers and things like that, which have been used for wine and beer now for many years. Um, on the first day that we were able to ship, uh, we did 10 Saturdays worth of business in one day. So wow. obviously a huge boon to a business that would otherwise be struggling heavily during COVID. Um, to date, we have shipped more than a thousand deliveries to customers and have yet had zero complaints or violations. So 
we've been just as vigilant with delivery as we always are in person at the distillery. Um, as Virginia is slowly opening back up, the online sales have leveled off a little bit at a steady lower level um, than they were when that first initial rush happened. Um, but we do take this very seriously. Um, in 2009, my wife and I gave up careers to found this distillery and a non-compliance fine could cost us 10 grand or more. Uh, you know, obviously we would never risk our business or the health and safety of our customers to cheat the system. So every distiller that I know of in Virginia, you know, takes this seriously and uh, is very compliant with the law and trying to make sure that underage consumers and inebriated consumers never uh, receive alcohol from our distilleries. So that's how we've been doing it. And I feel like we've had pretty good success with it so far and we're laying the groundwork for showing that it can be a successful model. No doubt about it, Scott, and thank you. And for everybody, you know, at least the first two or three months of the pandemic, you know, many of these distilleries had to shut down. A big part of their sales is foot traffic, people coming in to visit and tour the distillery and do a tasting. And all of that had to be shut down for distilleries all around the country. So delivery was truly an economic lifeline, uh, certainly in the early days and as we navigate through the pandemic. Richard, Richard Wynn, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine the challenges that you've had to face over the last five or six, seven months and the challenges for all restaurants around the country. Tell us, tell us about, tell us your story. And I know uh, safety, safety for your customers is uh, a top priority and how, uh, you know, the delivery of beverage alcohol has been helpful to keep your uh, great restaurant thriving. Thank you, for, uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, I can tell you firsthand that uh, we're still recovering from what the restaurant was back in March to what it is now. It's been two totally drastic things. Um, we initially closed on March 13th, but the week leading up to uh, that week of closure, our sales just, you could see firsthand, immediately dropped off. <laughs> and so going into the um, unsurety of the pandemic, our concern was we have a lot of employees that work for us for about over 20 plus years now that live in homes with elders. So initially when we were first discovering what this pandemic was, our concern was, you know, what good is opening the restaurant for a few hundred dollars should one of these guys go home, get someone sick, and then that's on your conscience. So we opted to voluntarily close until about May 21st, until we opened up again just for takeout because, you know, during that time I saw due diligence of how other restaurants were trying to adapt to the current situation that were going on. So with these restaurants being able to just do more of a takeout model, we pivoted toward that model. And since then we have opened our dining room up to 50% per the allowance of the state of Virginia. Um, even though the state of Virginia has eased back and said we can have 100% of our dining room, uh, comfortably 50% seems to be fine, but strict protocol uh, protocols in place for employees, um, mask mandates, um, hand sanitizers, you know, this is probably the first time in my life where my web restaurant supply chain store does not have hand sanitizer to this day. And so this was, um, you know, orders I placed back in March that I'm still waitlisted for. Uh, on top of that, I mean, um, we were sitting on a lot of alcohol inventory, you know, prior to this uh, pandemic. So thankfully, the Virginia ABC board was allowing us to make uh, alcohol sales for takeout customers. So that's helped move it a little more. Um, our craft cocktails are something we specialize in. So being able to sell those with the uh, ability to put them in mason jars, sealed, um, double sealed, in the takeout bag. So basically it's just triple seal before it gets to you. Uh, it's helped the restaurant move forward. But during these times, it's um, it's still an adjustment period for us now because you know, we're not sure when the offices around us are gonna be open again. A lot of these places are um, having their employees work from home. So we don't have that business of a uh, lunch business anymore. And so uh, <clears throat> some, I'm sorry. Oh, keep going, Richard, keep going. Oh yeah. yeah. So some of these uh, businesses um, aren't, you know, all their employees are working from home. So basically right now it's just, um, we're just trying to figure out what the best way to do is. And I can tell you 
at least our restaurant, I can't speak for others. I mean, even with our dining rooms back open again, about 90% of our sales have been takeout. <laughs> so it's just, um, it's hard to just adjust for pretty much a new supply chain that you have to factor in PPE costs too, as well as fluctuating food prices, you know, whether they are meat or dairy or you know, some, whatever we can get. But um, we're working as best as we can to um, follow all protocols, especially with the state governance in terms of alcohol. We're working closely with the Arlington Restaurant Initiative, which is a, it's a, a police median between the restaurants and the police department to make sure that we're serving alcohol responsibly. We're not over-serving and we're doing the best we can to be more of a community pillar. Terrific, terrific. Well, Richard, for all everybody in the in the DC area, everybody's got to go visit Richard's restaurant, Nam Viet, uh, in Arlington. Uh, look, uh, you know, these folks are our neighbors and our favorite restaurants and neighborhoods all around the country. And uh, that is just a picture perfect story on the challenges that he is facing every every day. So turning to Rick was sad. Uh, Rick, I'm, you know, I'm very proud to report underage drinking is at its lowest levels that it's ever been it, since it's ever been recorded. Uh, certainly with all the challenges that parents are having at home, virtual schooling and all of the above. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit, have we seen an uptick and uh, underage drinking during the pandemic. And uh, obviously this is something very, very important to the Distilled Spirits Council, uh, the United States, uh, responsibility.org for me as a parent mm -hmm. of a, a, young, a young teenager and all of the above. So Rick, tell us what uh, SAD's been doing on this front. Yeah, Chris, thanks so much for having me here today. If there's ever been a point, uh, it's 2020 where we need some good news. And you've hit the nail on the head with what that good news is, that underage drinking is at an all-time low. But that still means we need to be diligent to be able to overcome the societal challenge and, and work to make sure that everyone is safe. I'm so proud of my fellow panelists and the work that they're doing, the work that's happening at Discus and Responsibility.org to get the word out because it really is about access and understanding those points of access. We have seen some important steps taken and you've heard from uh, some of the titans in the industry already today who are taking those important steps to eliminate the problem of underage drinking, uh, such with age verification, um, with what you've heard about at restaurants and at retailers and on the delivery, delivery platforms. That's really great. That's a huge part of the puzzle. One piece of advice that we would give from SAD is to continue to ensure that your age verification provider has the most up-to-date information because we are seeing some sophisticated fake IDs. You're right, Chris, uh, you know, teenagers will find a way. And Creative, so it's important. no doubt yeah. about it. Whatever yeah. it takes, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Where there is a will, but again, helping teenagers from our vantage point, helping teenagers understand the importance of the developing brain, why that's important. And also on the retail side, helping our retail partners understand why enforcing that 21 drinking age is so important. And I know the folks on this call certainly understand that. Earlier this month, there was some data that was released from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and folks may have missed what that, what that survey was telling us. It showed us that about seven out of 10 young people did not pay for the alcohol that they consumed. So even though our efforts have really centered around access, a lot of these efforts that we've already heard about are not really where the young people are getting the alcohol. 29% or about that reported that they got the alcohol from someone who was 21 or older. 28% reported that they got it from their parents or a family member over the age of 21. 16% admitted that they got it from someone under the age of 21. And 12% reported it taking it from um, someone else's home. So I think the, the moral of that story for us, Chris, is that we still need to educate the audiences that I just described, helping parents understand the safety risk, helping uh, other folks who are using shoulder tap methods to understand the importance of enforcing that 21 drinking age and helping young people themselves. And that's certainly what the over 7,000 chapters of SAD that are active in schools and communities across the country have certainly done. Again, on the delivery side, we need to, we need to continue to talk about training. And I appreciate uh, our partners that, uh, that are already on this call have talked about the, the robust, robust training programs they have in place, but how do you deal with that situation where someone may be under, under the age? I really appreciate what Maria said about training the staff to maybe spot when something isn't quite right 
and give some talking points and some nuance to how to back out of that situation to make sure everyone is safe. It's really much more than just that exchange, right? It's really thinking about the health and safety of all those involved, thinking about the, 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 the situation in which these young people could be finding themselves and helping to ensure that every person in this process has that training that they need to keep everyone safe. I'd also encourage delivery companies uh, that uh, are maybe not doing an age guarantee and, and age verification at this point to change their position. SAD is certainly advocating hard on that because as Chris alluded, there, there still have been challenges associated with this. Again, from all the points that I mentioned from the health and, and safety survey. If companies are going to take responsibility for delivering the alcohol, it is our belief that they should then uh, subcontract, uh, if they're going to subcontract out, I should say, they should be responsible for making sure that anyone who's consuming that alcohol has gone through the age verification process. So there are, those are a few of the things that we're doing, applauding the steps of those who are on this call, applauding uh, discus and responsibility for the work they're doing, and trying to work together to make sure that we can curb underage drinking and reach a day where that, tr that number truly is, Chris, zero, because that's, that's the only number we accept. There is no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, an important point uh, that Rick was talking about, all the research will illustrate, look, teenagers, you know, are just going to be prone to make bad decisions from time to time. But the mm -hmm. earlier parents and teachers and school counselors talk to young people when they're in fifth and sixth grade, uh, uh, talk to them about, you know, the pressure points that they're going to have to contend with when it comes to alcohol. Uh, all the research validates that that helps them make better mm -hmm. decisions when they get into that peer pressure age. So 100%. Look, uh, the responsible service and consumption best practices for servers and delivery personnel, you know, certainly Discus has certainly been advocating that uh, the product needs to be served uh, in a sealed container, join it with food, always deny service for those under uh, legal drinking age, and never uh, serve someone that appears to be uh, greatly in intoxicated because bad things can happen and travesties can happen when people make bad decisions. And as this panel has illustrated, you know, it's a team effort. Certainly the distilled spirits industry has a role in that regard. Uh, one of our great companies, Brown Foreman, uh, started working with the hospitality uh, sector uh, it really, and it's called the pause campaign. Really just pause and take time to think about how we're doing all of this. And uh, it's a team effort or regulatory uh, uh, friends within government with General Nettles, very, very important. The, de the delivery companies and social responsibility organizations across the board, distilleries, moms and dads and parents. So with that, uh, we'd like to maybe open it up with some questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, cocktails to go, no doubt has been an economic lifeline uh, for uh, the hospitality sector over six or seven months. Uh, we've seen a couple of states uh, move in the direction to make cocktails to go permanent, uh, which, you know, nobody knows how the world's gonna kind of, when the world settles post pandemic, how are consumers gonna behave? How are consumers gonna go to back to restaurants and visit distilleries? It may be a long time, but, you know, with all of that, always top of mind has, has to be uh, the responsibility standards and how we as a community need to work together to ensure that people enjoy beverage alcohol as intended in moderation and for legal purchase age adults. But anytime you deal with alcohol, you've got you've to work hard to make sure to avoid the risks when it comes to underage drinking or abusive consumption as well. So any, any questions from the audience? With it, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Chris, I was going to let you know we have a question about FedEx and UPS and who holds the delivery person accountable for following ID policies. Not sure if anyone on the panel knows this or not, but I'll throw it to you. Yeah, Scott, you maybe have some appreciation for that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when we basically give over to a common carrier, the common carrier has certain rights and obligations. Um, and uh, so we have to do all of our stuff on the front end, like making sure it's marked as an alcohol package, 
the in the case of FedEx, there's a big purple label that we stick on the outside of the package that says do not deliver without a signature, adult signature required, all of those kinds of things. Having done that, then we don't have any sort of control over what FedEx does. You know, if they were to do something inappropriate, then the recourse would need to go back through, the, through them because we've basically surrendered the package to them. Sure, but it, just like what we've seen with Instacart and uh, Uber Eats, uh, you know, through their training and so forth, they've taken uh, responsibility, right, to be mindful of the delivery of alcohol. And I think uh, uh, FedEx and, and UPS and those great companies are doing that as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they've been doing it for a long time. So the fact that it's a bottle of spirits now instead of a bottle of wine really is, is not much of a difference from, from their perspective. Sure. Yeah, one, one thing I'll add from, from the Uber side is for the packaging piece, just to make it e as easy as possible for the delivery person to be able to discern kind of so what know, is what. Right? Yeah. We have, yes, we we make it mandatory that the restaurant packages the alcohol separately um, and makes it very clear that that contains alcohol um, in addition to the messaging that we send to the the delivery partner that the order contains alcohol. I mean, uh, uh, Allison, that's got to be critically important because that Uber driver's just trying to go from the one stop to the next stop, right? Yes. That's how they're making yes. their money. So making yes. sure it's clearly labeled will at least put that trigger for that great Uber driver uh, to make sure that they understand what they're delivering and, uh, you know, yeah, the obligations also, that they have also just makes it easy so if, if something does go wrong they can leave the other item the food but they cannot leave the alcohol and that's the alcohol. just made extremely clear to them in, in all the messaging that's right and you all have set up standards to allow that delivery driver to take that alcohol straight back yep. straight back to the restaurant great any other yep. questions there's a question on packaging. Um, mason jars are expensive. Has the packaging industry started to offer products like secure plastic packaging to meet the need of the at-home cocktails? Uh, great question. Maybe this is with, uh, maybe uh, Scott may have a view and Richard as well. I mean, I've just seen as a patron, you know, ordering food to go, the packaging at restaurants and delivering product has, has really been upgraded as a result. Uh, Richard or Scott, any views on the packaging? Because I, Scott, I know, you know, y'all weren't really designed to set up to be almost a delivery platform you know, yeah. six, seven months ago, you had to get packaging to help, right? We, we, uh, we actually have a few um, experiences with packaging. Um, when COVID hit and we were making hand sanitizer, um, there was a mad scramble uh, nationally to get packaging for hand sanitizer. Um, things like squirt bottles and lotion bottles and things like that. Everything was becoming hard to get. And then of course it switched into cocktails to go. And um, there are a lot of really cool packages available out there um, from like small little mini versions of what would look like a milk jug um, uh, to, you know, other types of packaging. So there's an infinite um, uh, set of, you know, packages available, but with um, everybody wanting it all at once, there have been some supply chain issues in getting packages um, that are, you know, most by and large coming from China. So that has been a bit of a challenge. Yeah, Richard, uh, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I have to agree with Scott there because, uh, I mean, the, the only reason, you know, we're using mason jars is pretty much, it just seems as more of a nice presentable medium. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are using those pouches out there, but I also see, <laughs> uh, I'm in the neighborhood where we have a lot of bars and I also see those pouches uh, greatly littered <laughs> around. So if anything, the mason jar kind of sets a little precedence, like, hey, you guys got your cocktail here, but maybe you want to use it for something else when you get to your house or you know, multiple of them, but I mean, we're always open and receptive to new things um, should they come about. So, um, you know, I go through probably about 30 cocktail or 30 mason jars probably a week. So I, I probably would sh should find something uh, alternative, but so far they've been working out pretty well. Absolutely. I did see we got a question from a, a, crate, a great uh, craft distiller from New Mexico, Colin Keegan, talking about how can we get the New Mexico governor to, to sign up with this. So, Colin, that question is probably for me. And, of course, uh, uh, we at the dis on the DISCUS team uh, uh, certainly uh, are committed to working with you in state to try to convince uh, New Mexico to step out 
to help the distilleries in the hospi hospitality sector there. I got a, I got a question uh, uh, maybe for both Allison and Maria. Uh, training the delivery drivers, I mean, that's not an easy task, right? Of course, first and foremost, it's all got to be done remotely and so forth. But uh, that's just something that's been a work in progress for y'all, right? And it's something, obviously, you've invested a lot of time and effort and staff for your training platform. Could you just, uh, that's just something that has to be an ongoing commitment, an ongoing training every day, right? Yeah, so if it's okay, I'll, I'll just chime in really quickly first. So. As I mentioned, we started we started this back in 2019 in Florida, and we worked pretty closely there with with experts in the space, and um, you know to develop the guidance and the materials um, that we do send to all delivery people who opt in, and we do um, kind of reinforce that information on an ongoing basis, so they don't just get it one time when they opt into doing the delivery; they get it pretty consistently, and they get reminders as well. Um, but it is something that, you know, we just kind of launched uh, more expansively um, this summer with COVID. And so obviously we're learning, we're growing, we're um, making progress uh, and we're continuing to work with advocates and experts to kind of um, kind of build out that that education and that um, training. Um, and so it's something that we're very, very focused on. And we know that's such an integral piece to getting this right. Um, so that's something that, you know, I, I, I thank you for that comment because it's probably one of the, the key, the top things that um, we're prioritizing with, with delivery. Yeah, absolutely. Maria? Right. We, we do the same. We, we send continuous reminders, whether it's in the app or via email. Um, the other thing that we do is we sort of look at the back end of the deliveries and, and see if there are certain things that we're finding that are strange or that need to be addressed with particular shoppers. Um, you know, if there's like a weird date of birth or a date of birth that we're seeing very commonly used or a date of birth that shows a person's like a hundred years old, you know, that that has actually been blocked. You can no longer do that. You can't do that. But if there are certain things that we're noticing in terms of how that shopper is entering information, whether it's a scan or it's a manual entry or whatever, whatever that looks like, we track that to see if we're seeing any patterns that may be problematic. And then we do have policies uh, in place that would allow us to remove shoppers from the platform, um, as well as consumers, although that, that probably gets done a little less than- Yeah, absolutely. So, so in Texas, we, can I chime in on this also? Yes, please, General Nettles. So, so because of the contract driver model used by most delivery agencies, we've also developed a online platform to certify these drivers' education training. Uh, we think it's important because although each of the folks on this apparently do a very good job of educating their folks, we want to make sure we had a set standard. So uh, a lot of times these drivers will drive for three or four different delivery companies. So we have a cert online certification program, cost about $25. They can go online, take the course. Uh, we hit essentially the, all the items that we're required to statutorily, but then some of the other challenges. And, and what I think is really interesting uh, in, in viewing the slides is we recently developed videos which actually walk them through, okay, if you go to the door and, and someone says, well, my dad's upstairs in the shower. Yeah, playing that game. It, yeah, yeah. And, and teaches them how to deal with that type of interaction. Uh, so I think it's very important. Uh, it's great to see these um, partners doing this, uh, but I, I, I kind of belt and suspender guy. If, if your drivers also have, take the TABC driver education training, then they're certified by us as having been trained. So it helps the retailers in our state to enter what we call safe harbor. So they're not liable if the driver messes up um, or the, the consumer delivery company. So that's one of the ways we try to help protect the industry partners. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, any, any other questions, uh, Brandy? Yeah, let's see um, if Uber and Instacart, do you have any information on deliveries that end up in returns? Is there a percentage or how often do you see that happen because uh, someone has misrepresented age or are intoxicated? 
great question. Maria or Allison? So, so this is a great question and, um, you know, we do have a lot of kind of investigations kind of going on to make sure that the item is actually returned to the restaurant. It makes it back. Uh, and we also have a process in place to, um, you know, deactivate um, the alcohol uh, piece and the alcohol delivery piece from that delivery person if we, we suspect things are going afoul there. Um, because we're so early in our expansion, I don't have any percentages to share, but I will tell you that it, it's, it's quite small um, from, from what I expected at least. Um, so those issues are, are much smaller than we had thought. And the other, the other piece too is, you know, when, a, uh, when someone is underage or something like that happens and a return process has to be initiated, um, the um, kind of incident rate is, is much lower in an incident. I mean, you know, maybe there's a problem. There's a, there's a ticket that's raised. There's, you know, the, the delivery person calls us and, and talks to our support. That is much lower during COVID um, than prior. And we suspect this is because, you know, people are trying to keep their distance. They're just being a bit more, you know, understanding and supportive of one another. Uh, but it is quite low um, from, from our numbers right now. Got it, Maria? Yeah, I don't have exact numbers either. I, I, I think the numbers are fairly low. The last time I looked, generally, it does vary by state. Um, but, you know, we do also incentivize the shopper to return the alcohol. We give them uh, a, a pay incentive to, to return it so that we, we minimize the number of situations where that may not happen. Um, and we think that, that that goes a long way to kind of reduce the number of issues that we've had. So our, our numbers are fairly low. I don't have an exact number to give, but similarly to Uber, they're not as high as I would have imagined. You got Chris, it. Yeah, Chris, Brandy? We have time for one more question. Um, so I think maybe the one um, about TABC, um, does TABC, have plans to evaluate or is in the process of evaluating its training of drivers? So the General answer Nettles. is, is we're, we're just getting ready to roll it out. We had a soft opening, so it's actually online now. Uh, we're working with our industry partners, specifically the Texas Restaurant Association, for them to give us feedback. Um, and, and of course, as all of our programs, we are constantly uh, reevaluating them, see what changes need to be made. Um, that will allow the, whether you're a restaurant and you want to use your own employees to deliver that, or whether you go through a delivery service uh, for us to have that. So it's very similar, in my opinion, is it'll be very similar to the seller server training that we have our bartenders do now. So that is what we plan to do going forward. But again, we just literally just rolled it out this month. Uh, it's on our website. Uh, but we will uh, analyze it as we go forward. Great, thank you, General Nettles. Well, as Brandy said, I think we've we've come up to our time. Uh, look, on behalf of the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States and and Responsibility.org, a big thank you to our panelists, uh, General Nettles. Uh, uh, thank you for your leadership, sir, uh, helping make Texans. Uh, safe while uh, working closely with the hospitality sector in Texas to keep them uh, keep them going through through the pandemic. Certainly, with Marie and uh, Allison, we really appreciate Uber Eats and Instacart's leadership and commitment to safety and training, and really just looking at all the the various uh, variables that you have to consider in the safe delivery of beverage alcohol. Richard. Uh, we, uh, hopefully you're going to get a great group of people coming to visit the restaurant and just keep your head above water and hang in there and hopefully in due course. Rick, of course, thank you for everything that you do in helping uh, young people make smart decisions. And, uh, you know, we got to continue to keep those underage drinking mm -hmm. numbers going downward. And then Scott, thank you for your leadership with the Virginia ABC and with the distillery and Look, this is a team effort. It's a work in progress. You know, uh, you know, we're going to learn as we move along. But if we have uh, safety and responsibility as a top priority, we can get through this. Help the hospitality sector stay alive uh, during the 
uh, during the pandemic, but at the same time, help patrons and consumers of great distilled spirits to have a cocktail, enjoy a nice cocktail with their dinner, certainly, uh, but do so in a safe fa fashion. So uh, on behalf of all the panelists, thank you uh, everyone for participating today. And uh, we'll be uh, sending out the deck and following up with everybody uh, here in quick order. So thank you for joining us. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.